Time to start recording the show. I'm up. Uh, you're, you're up. Sure you are. Sure you are. <sighs> hey, Patreons. Uh, Kevin here. Scott there. We'll do the formal intro with the show yep. uh, where you're going to hear some stories and some ooh, neat ooh, stuff. Ooh, ooh, hand me the stickers. Oh. Uh, just so you know, guys, we these, these are really neat three by three notepads, and they go into the see the the post it holders. And, and okay, don't throw anything. <laughs> so we don't become the uh, broken bad, promise. Bad, 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 bad. It's going to be a ride, folks. I'm exhausted. It's so we don't become the broken promise podcast. We got the stickers. We okay. actually got. Lots of stickers. Lack of, sti- lack of stickers. <laughs> and I picked up the shirts today, so hopefully soon. Check your mailbox. Thank you very much, everybody. So, and and during the show, and I'll make sure and show you guys, you'll know what this is. Mm-hmm. This cute little piece of plastic, and I will give you a hint. It broke. It's a Jeep part. <laughs> <laughs> it's a nose plunger. <laughs> hmm. No, 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 no. I have to sleep. I don't need that as I close my eyes. Shall we commence? Yes, we shall commence. I boobed it, you boobed it. And do you want to open it, or do you want me to open it? Sure, I'll open it. Open it away, sleepy boy. Okay, Rip Van <clears throat> Winkle. Crinkle. <laughs> I'm the wrinkled one. <laughs> You're still a young pup compared to me. Hey Jeepers, welcome to another episode, action-packed and thrill-seeking of On the Trail with Kevin and Scott. I am Scott, your slapstick parts post that is on a continual mission to have Kevin help keep me awake by kicking me in the shins while we record. And with that... I'm Kevin. I'm the uh, the engineer of the show, you know, the technical guy, the one who uh, reads the instructions, uses the right tools, and, you know, usually follows those instructions unless Scott wants me to do something that the instructions don't cover, which hey, occasionally happens. You want a challenge. <laughs> There's truth to that. There's truth. And speaking of which, uh, we've had quite a few challenges here over the last couple of weeks, but that's in the show. Yes. And while we will share what worked for us and as well as what didn't, hopefully this does. Yeah. It is always up to you to do your research, read the instructions. And please follow them. That's right. They did spend a little bit of effort making them. And you know, the best part is is that I am completely halfway falling asleep right now. The Patreons can probably see, as you called me, Rick Brand Quinkle or something like Crinkle. Um, But yet I can power through the beginning of this, this show right. For once. Somewhat intelligibly. Yeah, somewhat intelligibly. You actually got that word out. I'm impressed. Yeah, impressed, yes. Um, uh, <laughs> manageable vegetable. Okay. So, anyway, Scott, you were going to talk about a recent occurrence with a friend of yours. Yeah, there's a handful of stuff going on. But the first one, actually, we covered it in the one show. And kind of one of those things we, we I would like to reiterate. Because especially when you have the push button uh, the disconnects and a few other things. you know, we, we Kevin and I talked about when you're done wheeling, take... Five minutes out, walk around your Jeep, make sure you don't have anything hanging underneath it. Bend know. over, look underneath. Yep. You know, when you're reconnecting your sway bar, if you disconnect it, if you don't have the automatic disconnect like some fancy people, um, you know, look for anything odd. Guilty. Look for anything dripping. Yes. Look for anything out of place. Yep. Uh, look for things that just don't look Right. Right or normal. Especially before you hit the highway. And the reason why I bring this up is a good friend of mine at work, uh, I went to work the other day, and there was his Jeep on a rollback. And, mm-hmm. you know, tow truck being, you know, unloaded. I went, ooh, bad day. He goes, yeah, man. It, I was driving along, and the rear end locked up and spun me around and threw me into oncoming traffic. And, you know. And, and happily, he did not end up becoming somebody's hood ornament. Yeah, it's been a rough week for hood ornaments. But, but <laughs> other than that, though, one of the things that we were... I, I, I got right to work. So I, he, he's on the phone talking to somebody, and I stick my head up underneath there, and automatically, two seconds, I knew what it was because mm-hmm. I smelled it. I said, yeah, we just had a Jeep, uh, a Jeep event here. And I said, you went on the rocks, didn't you? He goes, yeah. Said, How'd no, you know? <laughs> yeah, and, uh, and uh, you uh, came down on something pretty hard, didn't you? Yeah, 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 yeah. And I said, yeah, you're out of, you're out of diff fluid. <laughs> What do you mean? And I, I, I come from under the Jeep. Bear in mind, as I'm telling this, I'm asking all these questions while under the Jeep. And I agree with my And he's not a shop guy, so no. he's dressed in nice clothes yeah. for a upscale automotive parts department yeah. guru kind of guy. And I got my head right up underneath that muddy Jeep, and I said, here's your problem. And I have my finger full of diff fluid. And he says, what happened? And I said, you came down in a rock and bent your uh, diff cover and I leaked all your fluid, fluid out. out. And, of course, sure enough, we get the Jeep on the lift, and it looks like the, his uh, differential went four rounds of Mike Tyson, because there's all the Skittles inside the thing. Oh, you know, all and, the gear teeth and bearings were seized, hey, and, and not one drop of fluid. <laughs> 
Gee, imagine that. Yeah, so know? he used four days of friend four my, 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 four fingers just doesn't work today. Hmm. Uh, four days, I guess, driving around with no tr- uh, diff oil. I'm surprised he got four days. I had to surprise you know to me 400 feet. Should. <laughs> well, and that's the thing I asked him. I said, you know, because he, he likes his tunes. Yeah. And I said, you know, you drive around all four days with the radio on pretty loud. He goes, no, 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 my buddy was driving. I'm like, and your buddy didn't call you and say, hey, something's singing back here. But you know, we had a little laugh. But we we started talking about upgrades and stuff like yeah. that. And I gave him some some. Some ideas to do, but you know that's just what happens. So take those few minutes. Look, walk around your Jeep. Look for the puddles. You know, we make we make the joke. You know, make sure to check your fluids. Yep, puddle of each. Yeah, uh, <laughs> pretty much each. You know, if it stops showing a puddle, it probably means it's empty. And yeah, I wish I could say that, but we got <laughs> my valve cover gas is leaking. So when I don't have a drip in the driveway, that's when I know to check the oil. I'm probably two quarts low. Yep. Well, you know, and it's funny you say that. Not Jeep, <clears throat> but yeah. a Mazda for a good friend of mine who has the horse barn. Right. He called me last weekend, and you know, the usual, I hate to bother you, but okay. <laughs> Just ask your question. Ask it away. <clears throat> you know, I, I don't understand it. Um, the wife's Mazda 626, it's got about 120,000, 130,000 on it. Yeah. It's got no oil in it. It's like, I said, oil light on? Well, no, that's what's weird. Okay, well, the good news is, you know, these little foreign buzz box motors i mean if they can get any oil they're not gonna the, the light stays off so it doesn't come on and, and they're somewhat operating he didn't burn it up fortunately yeah he did get it all the way down to a gallon i mean a quart of oil in the oil pan he burned almost a gallon <laughs> four quarts oh, and, but he doesn't have any spots and he doesn't see leaks and all right i'm out i'll come out so i drove out 45 minute drive out to the farm and he's got it on his little work platform on just, at least it was out of the sun and he's like, I don't want to pull that intake off. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do it. Okay, you don't want to, but I will. <laughs> yeah. Because I'm under there and say, I see oil, but it's like, I don't see four quarts worth of leakage. Yeah. Um, I said, talk to me. Smoke? Only when you start it, for just a few minutes. Clue number one. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, in, any other weird? Well, you know, I've told you before, I've got this whistling noise. Where? Point it to me. Show me where you think you hear right, it. Right. Manifold leak. This has got a plastic ah, manifold. Yep. When was, you know, I've had it into four garages, and that's why I'm bothering you, is I've had four different garages, and, you know, it was too expensive, or they don't do that, or this didn't do it, or I couldn't find it, or, you know, he says, I, okay, well, we did a little forensic. This is an old enough Mazda that it actually has a positive crankcase ventilation or PCV valve. Yep. That didn't rattle. There you, there the intake. You go. In fact, clue number, big clue number three, yeah. you know, other than the leaks, was when I pulled the manifold off. He's like, I'm scared to take that off. Why? It's a piece of plastic. I don't know. Okay, you don't understand it. I got that. I do. We're taking it off. Yeah. And when I tipped it up to lift it off, because you have to tilt it, it's on a V6 and it kind of hooks over the back of it. I probably poured mm, at least a pint of that quart of oil out of the intake manifold. <laughs> Yep. All over the engine. And I said, yeah, that was my biggest clue. Leaking from seals, most all seals, both crank seals were leaking. Uh, the seal around the spark plug boot, since this has the, mm-hmm. the centered spark Twin plugs, um, and oil in the center valley in places it's not supposed to be on the wrong side of the seals. Oil's getting pushed into the intake manifold, so it's burning on the startup during high vacuum. Um, not showing up the rest of the time, but that is because of the catalytic converter. Right. Uh, once the cat gets hot, folks, it burns up even engine oil. So he'd probably smoke in all the time really bad, but the engine warms up pretty quick, which tells me uh, pretty to go check why is the crankcase under positive pressure. It shouldn't be. Your positive crankcase ventilation system should put it under negative pressure right seals are designed for that negative pressure not for positive so we found the pcv valve and i was shocked because egr valve was in pretty sorry state too and it's one of these big electronic nightmare things yeah but we were able to clean that up i mean it was plugged you looked at the end of the egr port where it went into the manifold there was no holes yeah so we, we long story short cleaned all that up replaced the pcv valve Put the manifold back on, mm-hmm. and I realized I'm jumping a little out of sequence what we talked about. Right, right. But um, I torqued it in accordance with the proper sequence for plastic manifolds. 
Now, we don't have a lot of those in the Jeep world yet, but they're coming, and there's some on the newer motors, the yeah, modular the, motors. Like the 3.8 and the 3.6. 6 have yeah. them. And, folks, let me tell you something. You know, you read the sequence about torque sequences so you don't warp cylinder heads and you don't warp aluminum uh, intake manifolds. Plastic or worse. Yeah. And somebody had gotten on there, and the first clue was when I go to take the thing off. And it took two hands to pop the wrench <laughs> to break the studs loose. Oh. That was, yeah, that wasn't it. It was Joe Mechanic at one of the shops. Yeah. You know, and I'm going, uh, Earl here, give me the phone. Torque 14 inch pounds. Yeah. Uh, so, long story short, we put it all back, but I torqued it in the proper sequence. And because this is not a cylinder head with a circular spiral this one is a right to left but somebody had gone to one end gone to the other end and then tightened the ones in the middle i paid 600 for my new battery operated snap on impact range i'm using it exactly <laughs> so we put it all back together the car started immediately no blue smoke even with the con- you know things cold yeah. and i would have sworn it'd been i mean i i did use a can of carb cleaner cleaning out the manifolds oh, yeah. and stuff and uh no hiss no whistle no nothing and not even the the intermittent stutter that he had it was gone like well if you're not got a good intake system if you don't yeah (laughs) yeah so check 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 check. and that was the key is you know he hadn't done any checking and i said no you're gonna check the oil on this every week for a while aren't you and make sure that it doesn't continue (laughs) continue but you know as soon as we did that i cleaned off the seal spaces and the only reason he survived, that car survived, was at least he did one basic check, and that's just on a car. So your Jeep, you're going to go out and thrash it? Yeah. Yeah, get under there and check it. And more on that later, <laughs> where yours truly, this isn't a normal check, but we'll talk about that later on the interesting results that Scott and I discovered today. <laughs> Yeah, this this show, uh, uh, brace yourself, folks. This show is going to be really tech heavy because I know you all like that stuff and had lots of requests, lots of requests. And we've even though it's been a couple weeks since we recorded. By the way, this is show one hundred three. One hundred three. Yeah. So we're twelve minutes in. We just finally said one hundred three. That's okay. But um, they understand. No, but the, the idea is, you know, again, a lot of people asked about this kit. You know, surprisingly enough, I didn't get roasted too bad on the emails with the uh, the, the the body armor situation. Yeah. So far, so good. Yeah. So I mean, mm-hmm. but uh, I'll just let the other people catch up you know well you know and and body armor is a very personal preference yeah you know and i get it if you want the aluminum skid pans go for it and i kind of said that in the last show i just said my preference is steel where the rocks are and Mm -hmm. aluminum where it's just the trees and the bumps and the looks pretty yeah um but you know hey that's the joy of a jeep it's kind of like barbies for boys you know you can dress them up any way you want Let's say G.I. Joe's or action well, figures. Well, depending on how young these are, some of them may not know who oh, that is. Fair enough. Yeah. But, yeah, I get you. Uh, you know. But anyhow, <laughs> so uh, I tried to give you a, a reference, a non-gender no. specific, non-racial no. specific, <laughs> not anything specific reference. Uh, <laughs> come on Don't go to sleep, into Scott. the year. Come on into the year. But, no, I, I, what, again, we can segue into this because, again, it's, it's a very... On that subject, if you will, um, you had a little Look, adventure. Look, I'm just going to go ahead and get in the garage. When you're done, you just come tell me and follow into the garage, okay? <laughs> and this is where the show ends, folks. <laughs> no. <laughs> when a friendship dissolves in acid. No, but... Uh, <laughs> where did that one come from? I have from? no idea. <laughs> I am so slappy happy right now, guys and gals. It's not even funny. But, hey, real quickly, though, since we're on the subject of skid pans, you've had a little adventure with the uh, your Jeep, so we're just going to pretty much jump right on in <laughs> to the garage, if that's okay with you, Kevin. That's okay. Because we got a that's lot That's where we've been all day so far. Yeah. Not only am I on two hours of sleep, but mm. uh, we've also been in the 99-degree heat. Yep. Yeah, fall. It's where you, you – know, we, don't, we don't get a fall down here in Florida, except when we collapse from dehydration. Mm-hmm. But, uh, no, you had a little – adventure you had to fix on your tj which is a kind of a common problem as i'm doing this to yours i realize i'm going to have, have to, to do, do this it. to mine correct <laughs> and what he's talking about folks is uh, uh if you go back a little ways and most tjs have either not developed this because you know or or they've already been dealt with to some degree and this was a common problem with tjs um and I should say still is a common problem. Yeah. And it has to do with the check valve in the fuel tank, in the filler line. Um, most vehicles have some sort of a 
No, not really. Well, I guess it is part of the rollover system slash overfill system. That's a flapper valve, a floating ball, a popper valve, or something that as you fill the fuel tank, it rises with the fuel level. And then once you're full, it closes off, which then forces fluid up, the gas up to kick off the fuel pump. Um, and that's perfectly good. And its real reasons there is if you roll over, it doesn't immediately start going glorp, glorp, blorp, blorp out your fuel filler neck. And, yeah. You know, and turning you into, a, you know, some kind of funeral pyre or, you know. Yeah, because your, your, your gas cab, contrary to popular belief, I mean, it really doesn't hold. It's a vent system. Yeah. It is not a fuel <laughs> You know, it's designed to hold the vapors in to go through the charcoal system. And usually if you get a rollover, you're going to pop that sucker off. Yeah. Um, so what I'm going to say right now is whatever you do, if you choose to pursue one of these things that we're going to talk about, make sure you do not remove a fuel rollover control system without right. replacing it in kind. Yeah. And that's specifically what we're going to talk about here. And this was a big rage on the forums probably six, eight years ago. Yeah, it was a while ago. Um, and I did have it on mine, and that was TJ's had this weird habit that you would fill them um, at the gas station, and then when the fuel filler would close off, it would spit back upwards of a pint of fuel mm -hmm. up the neck and onto your slacks, skirt, hands, Shoe, shoes. whatever shoes. Yeah. Um, not called, really a great situation. No, it's know. called the TJ burp. It's a, yeah, exactly. It's a TJ burp. And there are quite a few different versions of how to fix that burp. And it has to do with the fact that the TJ fuel um, overfill control ball, mm -hmm. a ball or found out that they also came later in models at a plunger, like mine, um, the plastic or the seal material was not compatible with ethanol. Swelled up and stuck. Swelled on up. Yeah, and normally, <clears throat> dot, 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 they stuck in the open position. The vast majority. And so the most commonly accepted fix was to head on over to your parts store and order, pardon me, I'm going to speak blasphemy, and order a Chevy fill oh, pipe. You had me worried. I thought you were going to okay. say FJ Cruiser. No. And then do a little surgery on this Chevy fuel pipe. Their flapper door fits inside the hose. So you would excise the Chevy flapper door and then take your fuel filler neck pipe, the, the rubber piece from the steel top that was where you actually stick the nozzle in, right. and it goes down in kind of a little bit of a J curve into your tank, uh, which has got a plastic filler neck because it's a plastic tank, uh, and it's the same diameter as the GM. So you heat it up good and hot uh, in boiling water, you know, and it softens it enough, and then you put a little grease on the plug and you make sure the flapper is facing the right way and you use any dowel hammer handle screwdriver handle anything big enough to push that sucker down and i right. can remember you guys all coming over we just met back then i don't mm -hmm. know if you were there but i know ron was there laughing and brian was there giggling as i'm struggling to shove this check valve down and the whole idea is it should be hard it shouldn't move once it's in there it's you in there. want this the, the the cooling pipe to really grab it yeah it's like the the car sales you know when they're gone they're gone, gone. when yeah. it's in it's, it's in. in and the idea is that performs the same responsibility it lets the fuel flow freely downhill but the flapper closes and will not let fuel come backwards in any great quantity yeah we like to call that and and it, well it's, it's not really an official name we call it the gandalf valve in the automotive industry you shall not pass. Oh, yeah, but it doesn't usually stomp a staff on a rock and make it, the tunnel collapse. Oh, you can stab a screwdriver down the hole to get it to work. Yeah. Well, what we got? And, and here's my here's my story that developed recently. Yeah. Was mine was mine has the later little plunger. I'm playing with it here, and the Patreons can see it now. And the little plunger is I don't know. Looks like a golf tee with a. Um, Looks like a sombrero. Sombrero on top. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. Um, or a bowler and hat. And then there's a little spring that goes on the T portion, and it sits down in a plastic white cup with big windows cut out. It almost looks like an extended socket, like a deep well socket. Yeah. And the idea is the spring keeps the plunger pushed up against the, uh, the gas uh, filler neck yeah. without being too tight so that the gas can push it down and let the gas flow into the tank through a couple of openings. The problem is, is 
Mine stays down when you push it down. The spring can't push it back. You can even tap it on the table upside down. It don't move. And it don't move. you got to push. Well, With some force, actually. If you fill your tank completely full, like I did one time, and I had no idea, that you can slosh enough gasoline that it will hit the bottom of that and push it up. And it pushed it all the way up tight, like a full tank of gas during a rollover. Yeah. And it st- sticks just as well up as it does down. And it, yeah. And if you look at that, Scott, you know, it's going to be a little difficult to get fuel through that. Yeah. Oh, you know, yeah. It's, it, it's, it's, uh, yeah. There, there, there's a couple of little remaining openings. <laughs> yeah. 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 About a teaspoon an hour. Um, so I could not fill my TJ's gas tank any quicker mm-hmm. than you'd run it, it'd fill the fuel pipe, and it'd click off. And you'd have to go, what the heck's going on? And it would drain down enough to let you do it again. So you're sitting there going, click. And after about 10 minutes of that, you have about four gallons in your tank, which is enough to drive home disgustedly and go, what in the name name of God's green earth? And I took some pictures of, yeah, I saw the little float that was sticking up at the top. And I I took a plunger, a long rod, and went, "Mm, can I push that down? This is after pulling the fuel filler off the body and the hose off and all that stuff. And, yep, pushed it right down the hole. And it worked okay. One time, and guess what it did? Got stuck again. Boink, back up to the top. Yep. Now, I'm sure if I'd fought with it, taking it apart every time I filled it up and pushed it down and then let it slide up, eventually it'd wear itself to the point that maybe it would start working again. Yeah. Um, but remember, folks, I had already replaced this function mm-hmm. with a correct function. So Scott kindly came over today yeah. and helped me drop the TJ tank. Mm-hmm. And I'll give you the quick and dirty. It wasn't that bad. Yes, it took... Treating the bolts, I did manage to get all seven tank support bolts off without breaking a one. Mm -hmm. That in itself, I told him, I said, one breaks, we're stopping, holding it back up, I'll do this later. Uh, They all came down with that threat. That in itself is a victory. It is. Got the fuel filler neck off. Of course, it's been off a dozen times in the last couple of months, so that's not a big deal. Um, And then hooked up my transmission jack, which is just a little flat Harbor Freighty, you know. Yeah half-inch ratchet drive. It's a handy little thing, man. Yeah, a little flat jack that, you know, and took the weight of the tank, and we started lowering it down gently, and began to see quite a bit of jeeping with Judd, Jasper, uh, Georgia, Georgia, you know. Private uh, property. Yeah. In places that, mm, gee, I didn't know it could settle there. <laughs> you know, somewhere up there is my rollover valve, my, you know, yeah. fill assembly, my pump my fuel level sender yeah. connection it was about an inch deep Let, let's go for the archaeological dig yeah. uh, and, and the, i had to dig with it the pump just down far enough that you know the lines weren't pulling too hard yeah then we you know used the the little push connectors and i got both the uh the vent line on the one side the fuel pressure line on the other side to release properly and slide off did take about what Ten minutes of tap, tap, blow, wind, scrape, pl- tap, 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 to get the electrical connector to finally a- unlock. And Using then finally, the proper screwdriver as a hammer. Well, just as a tapper. <laughs> I know. You know, I was trying to knock. The problem is, people, this this is one of those Chrysler red sn- slide lock systems. Yeah. And you can get them free with patience. You know, air, air and, tapping. and tapping and breaking up the crud. You know, not tapping as in cracking the plastic, just to kind of like this. Let's see. Yeah, like that. Ah. Just gentle. Sorry about the static. We've got a cable going out here again. Yeah. Um, and uh, the my f- ear balls. Finally, we got it to come down and lowered the tank out. Got yeah. it out. Um, it took me longer to clean the driveway off after we rinsed the tank. And then it was the funniest thing because as you're spraying the top of it off, it ain't draining out of the bottom of the tank. Dra- <laughs> and then like, uh, so we started spraying the sides, and it, this mud's coming out of it. And for those that don't know it, TJ tanks aren't strapped up they're strapped down you strap the tank into that uh, uh, gas tank uh, skid pan mm-hmm. so you strap it down into the skid pan then you bolt the skid pan to the bottom of the jeep right so th- there are drain holes in it and mine were open from looking at it underneath what i didn't see was the hermetic <laughs> seal all the way around the <laughs> tank of solid mud <laughs> yeah and we actually, when we pulled the tank out, Scott, you can do the sound effects of we pulling that tank. Yeah. You know, 
exactly. <laughs> it comes um, and then I got to look at what was going on inside my skid pan. Yeah, Kevin doesn't have very many. Um, uh, what's the proper word to say? Arch nemesis, it, but rust. Rust. Kevin hates rust with a passion. I, you know, I, I, I kill it. And kill it, kill it, kill it, kill it. yeah, kind of like the Mio spiders. But no, yeah. The thing is, is that when when we pull that gas tank up, it was all muddy. Yeah. So as we're rinsing the mud up, and then the orange comes from underneath, and it wasn't orange like oh look, little small surface. No, it was rust. big carbuncles. It was big carbuncles. It looked like a gnarly looking. Gr- uh, um, uh, oh my goodness, like the pumpkin or whatever they're called, like the. Oh my goodness! Right now, especially in Halloween yeah. time, you go any farmers market, they got the the gourds. They have all the, nut, oh, the growths on them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it looked just like that, and I'm like, oh oh, Kevin, not gonna be happy. Oh, well, Kevin just kind of did a big sigh and grabbed the four inch grinder <laughs> with a flap wheel and attacked the inside, going, "Okay, can I see daylight through?" You know, because of the situation, people say it's take six six feet back. You know, I was staying twelve feet back because I didn't want to get tetanus from the air. <laughs> oh, it was flying. Oh god. Uh, but did manage to clean all all the rust out. Yeah, there was some pitting. Yeah, I could have pad welded a few holes, but they structurally it was still okay. Yeah. Uh, then we did a rust kill, um, primer, rust oleum, and then bed lining on top of it yeah. to get us back. And, and amazing how much lighter that assembly I was. Know, that's the craziest thing. It was all the rust. But I'm not, <laughs> I'm not exaggerating when I tell you that as I was trying to rinse the driveway down, I had a wall of mud probably... Ten feet wide and three inches thick that yeah. came out of, it, over mm-hmm. off under or in between that tank. It would not push out of the way. And the, and the, the interesting thing was is why we're doing all this stuff is that you know you, you kind of think about like again with the rust and situations like that, but. It, it, we had that conversation about body armor, yep. and of course, there's this big gnarly dent that made my backbone hurt for a yeah, second. Scott was in the back of my jeep with He's, another person riding shotgun, and we came off an obstacle that I misjudged, yeah, and landed on that skid plate and mm-hmm. put about a three inch long, mm, three quarter inch high divot. Oh yeah, and he's sitting there trying to hammer that thing back. Guy goes, ah, at least it's, it's flat and smooth now. <laughs> I'm like, okay, but that's why we talk about steel skids. Yeah, the factory steel skids on well, a T. TJ gas tank, they're impressive. Are, they're impressively stout. Uh, but long story short, what you do then is once I got it to where I wouldn't be letting the remnants of the Sahara Desert into my fuel system. <laughs> uh, I mean, and that took a lot of cleaning around the lock rings for the for the pump and the sensor system, and picking out rocks and rinsing it again, and yeah. then washing. And I still had a bunch of crud when it came off that was around the gasket. Yeah. Um, and then you do something that. I will admit, you know, makes most people's blood run cold. You kind of have to trust the fact that, um, you know, for gasoline to burn, there's something called the lower explosive limit and the lower, the upper explosive limit. The lower is, you know, if you're too low, you don't have enough gasoline in the air. If you're above the upper, you have too much, don't have enough air in the gasoline. Yeah. And so you're really hoping that the tank is in that upper explosive limit <laughs> because you stick your arm into the pump hole. Mind you, this tank is not empty. Because yeah. even though it said empty yeah, and the gas say. light was on, there's probably five plus gallons of fuel in there. I have a new respect for the reserve on my TJ. Well, and that's the thing. Like everyone keeps saying, like Scott, what do you do? And I said, well, the first thing I want to do when I get a new car is I see what the fuel capacity is like on the Gladiator. It's 23 gallons, approximate. I mean, don't hold me on that. Run it folks. to the light. I run it to the light and then I slam it full. Yeah. Okay, not you know brim it, but I, I, I do the one click, click. Off. and I go okay. How many gallons I put in? Okay, I put in seventeen gallons. Yeah, I do it again. Seventeen gallons. Okay, at that point, I'm safe to say when the fuel light comes on, I have three gallons because even though it says twenty three, yeah, I'll go seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. I have three gallons in reserve, and so many miles per gallon on average. Exactly. Other than the slosh factor of okay, it may you get down that last gallon, you may not be able to pick it up. And what most people don't know is like the 91 YJ mm-hmm. that I had was a 20 gallon tank. Yep. It just had an extended filler neck, so it was a 15 gallon tank. Right. Almost as far as I know, every research I've done, every TJ tank's a 20 gallon. Everyone's no, no, I got a 15 gallon. I can't get more than 15 gallons in it. Well, you got five gallons of reserve, folks. Well, you got approximately, well, not every kind, because you and I, you mentioned yep. the board about headroom. Yeah, there's headspace. You, know? you got to take, there needs to be air above that fuel for expansion and contraction. Yeah. But Long story short, as you reach your hand in through there, back over towards the filler neck. Now, some series, I don't personally have experience with those, but I've read other people's accounts. The 
the check is a ball, a white plastic ball that sits in a little tubular bird cage mm-hmm. below the filler neck, and you have to kind of reach in there with side cutters and go nip, 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 and then pop it out. Mine was a snap-in cage. Yeah. And I literally reached in, and I'm feeling it. It's like, that doesn't feel like a bird cage. And I could feel the little retaining clips. There's four of them. And I just went, hmm, I wonder if that'll pop, pop right off. And... Pulled it out and said, okay, that job's done. Now let's put this whole thing back together before the garage goes up in a big pyroclastic explosion. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, it, and again, Kevin, it, Kevin, I reiterate a thousand times, is he replaced his valve with another one. Yes, and I can't stress that enough, folks. If you're yeah. going to remove the factory filler neck check valve, do not do it without putting a equal or better system in its place yeah um, replacement tanks have better versions of this uh, or you can do the trick you can look it up there's a thousand uh, videos and write-ups on the Chevy part that will fit in the fuel neck filler line that will do the same thing uh, you do not want to be on a trail turn topsy-turvy and hear that bloop 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 Boop, yeah. as gallons of gas pour down behind you and you're sitting there going um i'm stuck <laughs> yeah yeah that's not the time you want to be panicking and uh, so realize, yeah. please 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 do not you know but you can look up there, there's a lot of stuff out there but it was kind of interesting so now i feel perfectly safe and no we haven't been out to the gas station yet but i should be able to fill the tj full mm-hmm. and be able not and then do it another time right after it without having to stick a freaking rod down <laughs> take the filler neck out and poke this little crazy valve down hold on hold on i gotta stab my jeep in the neck yes what? nothing hold nothing. on it just sir why do you have a long screwdriver Shh. now on the other hand i do i, I will laugh hysterically because we were the, the amount of dirt i just can't stress enough the amount of dirt gravel Rocks. I mean, yeah. serious gravel that came out of my gas tank area. Um, it was. <laughs> the, 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 there was so much that his neighbor started panning for gold in his driveway. <laughs> Close. <laughs> it was, I'm Prospector 249er. I'm trying it to find was, me some gold dust. I didn't know you could put that much garbage in there, you know. Um, and it does have drain holes. Yeah. It just. Well, especially now. <laughs> yeah, well, now they actually can drain. Um, I did check the bottom of the tank for wear to make sure it didn't have. Have any damage from yeah. the impact of the, the the guard? No. Fortunately, it's a very strong. I think it's a polypropylene or polyethylene yeah. tank. The, the, the weakest part on those tanks is the seam where they're were welded, like where they're heat welded together. Heat welded together. The, the, those seams split, and especially after a rear end accident, and oh, yeah. a lot of times you'll never know. This is what happened with my YJ, and it's like all of a sudden you know start smelling gas. I start smelling gas when I fill it up. I'm like, man, why does it smell like gas? And then I would never see leaks on the ground because it was evaporating. Right. Yep. It was a small little crack, but then I kind of realized. Okay, looking at the history, uh, you know, the, even though the Carfax was clean, yeah, the back had been repainted, and then I'm mm. like, okay, someone got in a little bit of a love tap, and I bought the last YJ tank in the country back in 1998. Huh. But what, what's the story for you guys that are listening to this? Is you, you guys and gals, is don't be afraid. If you need to drop the tank, you will need some tools. Um, the biggest one you'll need is a set of the little slide-on collar for taking gas lines apart. Yeah. Okay. Um, I was laughing. I have the expensive little metal scissor ones that you... I don't think I've ever got them to open a thing. What works for me is that cheap little blister pack of multicolored <laughs> yep. plastics that are hanging on every part store shelf. And you know what? They, they're starting to wear out because... They actually have worked really well, and mm-hmm. I just a matter of fussing at arm's length under, and finally getting the one thing slid on, and oh, pop, that came off. Fuel lines off, okay, and then same sort of thing. Now, the vent line, I didn't have one quite the right size for the vent line, but the vent line connectors are open and exposed because that's not a pressure system. So yeah. I was able to take two picks that you get, you know, for picking hoses and that stuff, and hold the tabs back in it again pop right off also uh the electrical connector is a standard four wire mopar style slide lock connector you got a hundred of them under the dash and under the, the hood and all those places it is going to be completely seized with dirt just yeah. expect it yep and all i did was play tattoo on it with a light tapping of a screwdriver and as you did that you could just see the sand and oh. dirt sifting out blow it off do it again blow it and then eventually after about five minutes yes you can get frustrated but event five you know you, you try and move the red slide it doesn't move then you try again and it does 
Okay, great. Now let's go back and tap around the little push button part of it. And eventually, you know, let's try, you know, pop. The connector came off clean, nothing yep. broken, went back on clean. I did add some uh, silicon grease, dielectric grease, whatever, not to the electrical connectors, but to the seal area yeah. on all of these connectors as they went back together. Um, the ca- gas can came down, our gas tank came down without too much trouble. We did use penetrating lube on the bolts, mm-hmm. um, but I've been after them before, so you know when I'm under there, I know where they are. There's four on the back that have uh, like a, a little lock tray. They're speed nut bolts that sit in a little tray that keeps them from turning that take to the four right under your bumper in the back, and then there's mm-hmm. three on the front of the tank up You'll find if you jack the Jeep up a little bit and let the rear angle axle droop, it doesn't have to droop a long ways, you know. Yeah, it's like, I think, a couple inches. A couple of inches was it. Just so that if you were looking from the diff, if you're looking at the diff, you can see it below the gas tank. It gives you a little more room to get up there with an extension and actually get those bolts out and to, quite frankly, drop the tank down. Yeah. I didn't even take the wheels off. We just let them hang, to, and they were touching the ground, so it was supported. Uh, but the jack stands, the wheel chocks were chocked and all that kind of stuff on the front end. Um, it took us about an hour and a half of fussing with the mud and the mire to get it out, to get it cleaned, um, and then uh, discover the rust. <laughs> yeah, we, I think we were pretty much done. We started at like 9. We were done by 2, and that was with the lunch break and all that. Too. Yeah, with going out to lunch and then reassembling. Yeah. And uh, the closing hint on that one for anybody who is going to attempt this is do not stick your key in the ignition and expect it to work perfectly when you first turn the key on. Don't even crank because you've opened the fuel line. It's a high-pressure fuel line. You've got air in it. What you do with any Jeep, and it's in the service manual, hint, hint, nudge, nudge, is turn the key to on, count to three, slowly, three seconds. That's the run time for the pump in pre-start. Right. So you'll click it on, and if you're listening, you'll actually hear, mm, turn it off, turn it back on. Mm. And you do that three times, yep. and you will pressurize the rail. Even though it'll still have an air bubble in it, you'll bring the rail back up to 60 PSI, and the check valve will hold that, so that bubble will be compressed. Then you go ahead and crank. And mine fired right off, mm-hmm. and after about... 30 seconds we let it idle like you heard this and then it came right back it just that was the air bubble burping chopped through up the air bubble chopped up the air bubble gave it to all six injectors and <laughs> went back to running again exactly um so now i'm going to go down and fill the tank you know probably sometime tomorrow or sunday when i get a chance to actually drive my jeep so thanks to scott i can drive my jeep yay well uh, that's uh let's say the, the other the cool thing that we did you know we want to take a quick little break yeah, and then we'll get back to the other fun that I've been having over the past three weeks. <laughs> exactly, we've been we've been busy little uh, parts people and Jeep people these past three weeks. So uh, with that, we're going to be right back in one quick moment. Hey, Jeeples, how you doing today? This is Scott, uh, one of your favorite On the Trail podcast. Just to remind you, as always, to check out our Patreon page, our YouTube page, the 4x4 Radio Network. And again, thank you to all of our corporate sponsors. We really appreciate all of our Patreons. Everything you do and everything, exactly, because... Uh, you know, being a patron has perks. You know, some stuff going on there to them soon. So with that, we're going to get back to the show, back to the action, and back to Scott's bad dad jokes. Hi, Kevin. Bad dad. Well, I'm a dog dad, so most oh. of my jokes are okay. like not furry. Wait, yeah, that joke was bad. Yes, it was. <laughs> oh, Gunner's gonna bite me for that one. Probably. No, yeah. he'll just lick you when you get home in the face because you've been gone all day working on somebody else's Jeep. You know, the thing is, is he is such a cat because when we try to go, I try to leave, he he wants his butt scratching. So, he's just a good cat. You scratch a little back area and he just ar- arches his back up and just like starts like going, hey, like licking his lips. Yeah. You just give him little scratches and he just loves it. I'm like, man, were you a cat? Yeah, well, you know, he did hang around with cats for years. Yeah, exactly. Well, uh, let's move on to some of the other interesting projects. Which one should I talk about first? Well, I think we should shift Driving gears. Driving Miss Daisy or, you know... Um, well, let's, let, let's, let's, let's uh, shift gears to uh, Mark Lawson's friend, and then okay. we can go over to... So uh, that's literally shifting the, gears. The, the Cupcake Crew. Okay. Um, <laughs> cupcake Factory, sorry. Well, the, the, the other thing he's referring to is a... 
a good friend of the show, Mark Lawson, who owns Jeep Lab here in Tampa. His stepdad has a friend that they go wheeling with, mm-hmm. and during one of the wheeling tri- trips, the uh, the friend who has, I believe it's a TJ also, mm-hmm. with a V8 conversion. Yeah. But it retains the factory AX15 transmission. Yes. And a little over ego no a no, little little heavy right foot in a better, wrong yes. um, situation resulted in a his French dictator Napoleon blown apart oh, his yes. transmission yeah he he uh, well we didn't know at the time we we had to go do some forensics uh, but we ended up rebuilding an AX15 and it was okay he bought a junkyard one or a friend had a damaged one or whatever one and he'd bought that for 75 bucks he had his and the and a rebuild master rebuild kit and he got a really good one i wish i knew what where he got that really really good one yeah it was one of the better ones i've ever handled as far as having every part we needed yes uh and we took two and made one Mm -hmm. okay actually two in a kit uh (laughs) yeah and it was a long day. Uh, it's uh, AX15s are not for the faint of heart. Okay, yeah. uh, they do have some really neat things. Turns out I learned something new, Scott. Too. What's that? As much as the world runs around and says, "Oh, AX15s, they're they're almost gone. You can't find them. They're hard to find." Uh, and I will admit, if you're looking for a Jeep AX15 and don't have one at all, they're hard to find. But they're actually the same transmission internally as the. Toyota, I believe it's R120. Okay. The five speed in the uh, pickups and uh, uh, Toyota 4Runners, particularly in the 70, 80 series, 70s and 80s. And the cases are a little different in terms of the four case and the rear case. But the way the AX15 is made, folks, and this is kind of the neat part, the center plate. And all the rails, gears, and shifts are the same. Wow. Now, you may have to do a different first motion. I haven't confirmed, but the one I looked at, the first motion shaft, which is the one that sticks into the clutch and the pilot bearing, looks identical. Now, you know, I don't know with the metric versus the U.S. Right. You know, but... Uh, so there's a potential for a whole lot of parts for AX-15s out there sitting in the junkyards and in earlier years, Yotoda trucks. Yeah, I actually thought about converting my NSG-370 to a AX-15. 15. Well, folks, what's neat about the AX-15 is most transmissions, the gears are basically mounted either in the rear case or in the front case, and the other end just kind of closes the clamshell. Right. The AX-15 doesn't do that. The AX-15 carries the load on a center plate about an inch thick. And if you look at it and you've got it in there, you'll see it. You'll see a front aluminum case and a rear aluminum case sandwiching this inch thick plate. um, And it's got a bunch of fittings on it. Those are for the check balls that make sure that you only get in one gear at a time and springs and all that kind of stuff. So you actually can take the shift tower off and that's four bolts and then one slider that comes out through the back of the transmission um, again not hard and then slide the front half of the case off take the bolts slide the rear half we made a little stand that you put two bolts in the bottom holes of that plate yeah, and that mount was... it to a to a little wooden frame like a little h that was ingenious man uh, and it holds the transmission up in its normal position, but naked, <laughs> yeah. you know, with all the gears. And at that point, you go, okay, let's start looking. Yeah, broken, broken, worn out, worn, broken, worn out. <laughs> yeah. uh, abuse uh, kind of a situation. And I shouldn't say that because Ron's was broken worse than, than Brian's. <laughs> Brian, yeah. Brian really, most of his trauma was the first motion shaft. Uh, there was some trauma on the rear case. It wasn't bad. But the donor tranny that he had for parts was in better shape. Right. So we cataloged and disassembled the entire system. Uh, I won't go into great detail on that because there's lots of videos out there. But I will tell you point blank, don't try it without the service manual. The service manual is available online. I'll even go so far. I have the PDF for, from Mopar for the AX-15 for a complete overhaul. You know, I will share it if requested. 
And I know, Scott, that yeah. usually means I'm going to get a lot of emails, or you're going to be sending me a whole lot of emails going, can you send me that file? Got another one. Um, and, and that's fine. It's 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 a scary document at first, the mm-hmm. first time you read through it, because it kind of, but in, in light of doing it, it's literally a step by step. Take these bolts out. Remove this. Pull this pin. This is. It even covers how to pull and reinstall the balls, pills, and pins of the inter the shift linkage interlock. And that will drive you nuts. Scott was there for a little of that going, yeah. okay, where's this spring? Where'd that ball go? Where, where's the pill? And everybody's looking at me going, what's the pill and i had to show them okay this thing that looks like a grain of rife is a pin that goes inside each of the lock shafts and that's just a pusher that goes from one to the other the pills the pills look like pills pills or mike ikes or solid steel pills and then the balls well they're the same size as the pills but they're round rather than oblong and there's a sequence you put them together in the shift rails and it's not difficult if you follow the manual it tells you exactly which one goes where and how and you pack things with grease so they stay in place and that was hunky dory we did fight with a few things okay a few components were <clears throat> supposed to be slip fit yeah. they didn't exactly want to slip anymore because <laughs> they'd been hammered a little bit and we got them apart and my biggest challenge was the uh the shift dogs in the mm-hmm. synchro system, you know, and they, they were fighting me. We finally got them all in. Long story short, we rebuilt transmission. It took about a solid, what, eight to ten hours yeah. to do it complete from top to bottom. And that includes some time with the micrometers to make sure that the shaft wear and plate wears and free plays were correct, some feeler gauges. Um, but that was one of those one, more interesting one where I promptly was offered a job in my own bay if I wanted to start doing transmissions. And I was like, yeah, no, no. not happening here, folks. Nope, not at all. But I will tell you, if you're fairly good with a wrench, you know how to use both a F mic, a C mic, and a feeler gauge and know what they mean, you know, and how, how to use them, you can, build an a, you can rebuild an AX-15. It's, I wouldn't try and do it in one day. It's better if you do the teardown. Take a deep breath, go take a nap, sleep, you know, wake up the next day. Take good notes. Take good notes, you know, and put it all back together, you know, following the book. You can bring it back to brand new status. So, you know, and that's a good thing. Now, I told him, I said, I'll give you a 15 15 warranty on it. He's like, What's that, 15 minutes or 15 feet outside the door? Because I know what <laughs> engine you're putting on the front of this. Uh, hey, really quickly, um, uh, did you want to? Yeah, I, I see the back three. We're we going to pause for a moment, folks. I'm going to change the battery. Yeah. Oh, Ron broke his Jeep. Good. No, I didn't say that. What did you say, Ron broke his Jeep? Mm-hmm. Oh, that's sorry about that. Oh. Did you... Because I got no I, audio. I never unbooped. Test testing. Are you there? Uh, yeah. Hello. Ah, there we go. Hey. Ah. All right, folks. Sorry about that little uh, blurp, but yeah. I forgot to change the battery during the commercial. I should have done that. That's what we're supposed to do, and you didn't let me do it. You must have been asleep on your job. I'm a... We'll sleep on a lot of stuff. <laughs> now, one of the things, too, we talked about when we were taking the transmission apart is I asked Brian, I said, hey, you know, what kind of fluid are you going to put back in this? Mm-hmm. And Especially because I had my AX5, which is sister transmission to the AX15. And he goes, oh, I brought the 89 gear wheel. I'm like, GL5 or GL4? Well, oh, no, GL5. That's what the book says. I'm like, oh, okay. Okay. No, yeah. no, we're going to go I, I, into I, this. I, I should take this back because... No, no, no you're fine. This is real. This yeah. is what you did, and yeah. you pulled up a TSB. Well, not really TSB. Here, here, here's back what it is. When I, when I did my second transmission, or first transmission, I ordered the uh, Mopar fluid, and I got AX15, AX5 fluid right. from Mopar. Mm-hmm. And I went ahead, and I, I put it in, ran it, beat it up, and you know I got 80,000 miles. Because, again, 80,000 miles out of an AX5 transmission, That's beating up with 31 impressive. tires. Yeah, it's impressive. So, and again, I'm rough on stuff. So when I rebuilt the transmission again, I got I ordered the same part number and I got a quart of 10W30 motor oil. Right. Wait, what? 
oh no yeah this is what you're supposed to use now i'm like oh, okay whatever so i did my research and i ran the part number through the catalog because i sold mopar parts at the time mm -hmm. and sure enough the mopar uh, ax5 ax15 fluid does change over to 10w30 and the reason 10w30 being motor oil motor oil folks. is because the gl5 fluid the, the uh, sulfur or whatever the detergents in it are a little too aggressive for the brass synchros. Right. And I'm like, okay. So, of course, I use the 10W30 and I put a little bit of Lucas in it because, you know, to thicken the mix. Mm -hmm. But everyone's like, oh, no, you don't need to do that. You'll, you'll seize the motor. And it's, oh, it's funny because when you look at the forums back then, it was always a bu buddy's uncle or a friend or a somebody else had a transmission locked solid up because he did that. Yeah, no I'm firsthand like, information. Yeah, and I'm like, okay, well, quick question. Honda uses 30 weight motor oil in their transmissions and, and their and their, mm -hmm. and their manuals. Ford uses ATF and yep. their manual transmissions. Okay. Um, you know what? I'm going with what the manufacturer recommend. And AX5 is an Asian transmission. And, and some ASIN, of the, yeah. ASIN or whatever. And, and so I'm like, all right. So it said 1030. I put 1030 in it. And that's perfectly fine. But let's talk a little bit, as I did when I was talking to him, about yeah. the transmission. And I might link in transfer cases because you see a lot more of this in the uh, NP transfer cases and the lubricants and how they fit into the different systems. Um, first off, the transition from um, gear oil into uh, uh, motor oils into even lighter weight transmission fluid, automatic transmission fluid and that stuff. Part of that was driven, uh, unfortunately, not because of wear characteristics, but because of the uh, mileage requirements. Yeah. Heavy gear oil drags down the engine, uh, you know, takes power, and that chops into fuel economy, and as manufacturers continue to being pushed higher and higher and higher for fleet mileage, they continue to go to lighter and lighter lubricants which draw less power and they because now of course they can manufacture things to tighter tolerances because oil grease uh, gear lube all of that is about keeping a film of a lubricant between two pieces of metal and the smaller the gap the thinner the fluid can be and still support it okay whereas the bigger gap you need something thicker to keep it filled up otherwise it leaks out real quick okay yeah and uh, one of the big things is in an engine, um, you're under pressurized oil system. All right? Right. In a transmission, you're not. Now, why does that play into a transfer case? Because what have we seen in the transfer cases? The original, let's use the NP231. What did it originally come with? 7590 gear lube. Right. Then you saw a while that, oh, no, 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 no. Okay, we're going to use motor oil. No, 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 no. Now let's go to transmission fluid. Okay, and I know mine requires automatic transmission fluid. And everybody says, well, that's because it's bolted to an automatic transmission, and the fluids, no, it's not. No. It, it doesn't go between the two of them. However, in the case, there were changes over the year, and that's what people miss. And you, if you've done a rebuild on one or a... Uh, a uh, uh, Slip yoke eliminator. Slip, uh, slip yoke eliminator kit. Yes, yeah. thank you. And well, it's not so much in the SYE, but in the rebuild kits. What you'll find is instructions that tell you, oh, well, take the center shaft. If yours has a needle cage bearing, tap that out and replace it with the provided sleeve bearing. All right. Well, why do they do that? Well, because you... Needle bearings, cage needle bearings, don't really work as well in motor oil unless they're submerged in it or in a pressure system. Right. Uh, but they're very strong bearing. Okay, that's why they were used in the old ones. It was, you know, they built them to go behind anything. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, and they also knew they were going to be running in 7590 gear. The rebuild kits all assume that you're going to be doing it into the more modern, and you're going to be using the lighter weight goils. So you're going to go to a sleeve bearing, which has a broader surface area and can be lubricated effectively with its smaller gap by a lighter weight oil. Um, well, the AX15 in question that we were rebuilding doesn't have a single sleeve. No, I take it back. The fifth gear was a sleeve bearing. Everything right. else was needle cage. The rebuild kit came with full needle cage replacements, and um, as well as all new synchros, roller bearings, ball bearings, 
and these were not fine ball bearings. These were, you know, the, the ball bearings and the and the rollers were probably anywhere from well, about three eighths of an inch in diameter, five sixteen. So they're massive. Yeah. Um, and the AX15 does not have a lube pump. Okay, it's it relies on the gears that sit at the bottom of the case to pick it up and sling that lube. Now, it, it doesn't take a genius to figure out that um, thin stuff doesn't sling around as well as thicker stuff. You know, you, you think of cold honey, you can grab that stuff and throw it like a baseball. Uh, <laughs> Here, Timmy, catch. No. Pretty much. So... Uh, Part of the reason, obviously, was the fuel economy. The second thing came with, as Scott mentioned, it, the first incarnations of GL5 did include detergent systems in there and pressure agents that were somewhat acidic. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, How to turn your, your singers into disco glitter in one easy step. And that's exactly what happened. It would eat up the yellow metals is the term they would use. The yeah. coppers, bronzes, brass alloys, all of those, and it would just absolutely break them down in short order. And again, without going into great detail on a synchro sleeve, its interface is shaped like uh, rough. It, it, it's uh, concentric rings that grab onto a cone on the gear to spin it up to speed. Right. And so it's fairly fine shape. You know, it's not big, thick chunks of flat uh, brass. It's some really small stuff. And it eat through those like nothing. And then the synchro teeth themselves, the parts that the slider goes over to engage the gears, they just crumble away. You know? Well, nowadays you can get brass friendly or they call it yellow yellow metal friendly yeah. uh gl5 at least not without ease <laughs> yes and and one brand that we both have experience with is um royal, royal purple. purple yeah um and that is synchro friendly now what's the re what's the bad side of using 7590 you're going to have more drag. You're going to lose a little horsepower into the transmission because yeah. of the heavier lube. However, this guy, Brian, is putting it behind a V8. Yeah. He so. is putting a lot of pressure on these gears. Yeah. The cushioning of that heavier gear lube, the fact that his is still predominantly uh, ball roller and needle bearing supported means it will behave and support you know live better right. with the thicker gear loop um if you have one of the more modern ones it's all sleeve bearings you know whether it's a transmission transfer case then by all means stay away from that stuff but the service manual for his model of ax15 clearly said 7590 GL4 or GL5 yellow metal friendly. Yeah. Uh, so here's the thing that you just kind of have to know your gear. If you don't know your gear, absolutely stick with the uh, the owner's manual. Don't yeah. play games with it. <laughs> Follow what it says and it'll last a lot longer. Well, and that's one of the things in the parts business is you know when we had Dextron, you know, 2. Yeah. Dextron 3 came out. You and you know? couldn't buy Dextron 2. And, and then you know then Dextron 4 came out, you know. Dextron yeah. 5 was synthetic, but you know DOT 1, then DOT 2, then DOT 3, you know, you can go up but you can't go backwards. If you have a DOT 5 vehicle, you can't go to DOT 3. No, and if you actually have a DOT 3 vehicle and put 5 in it, you have to flush it yeah. because the two will not work happily together. One no. is petrol based, the other is uh, silicon based. Yeah. And they do not play well together. They do not. Um, well, this is, so again, I understand when they say, oh, it's GL5. The book says to use GL5. And I, and being partial, I was a hybrid. I, I was yeah. part old school and part new school when I did my parts. You know, I learned on a paper catalog. Yep. You know, not, not so much computer stuff. I had a bunch of, you know, guys just like you, Kevin, who, you know, rolled up their sleeves and, di and didn't let the computer do all the work, you know, actual techs. Mm -hmm. So I got that, you know, and, there, and sometimes the old school guys would be like, nah, GL4 is there for a reason. Let's not just trust the new stuff yet. In some cases, it's good. Yeah. But, you know, I, so I always kind of worry when people go, oh, it's all the same. You yeah, know? it's not all the same, folks. When and if you don't know what you're playing with, you can destroy things in and short order. Perfect examples is, you know, in, two, in 1996, I had a co-worker, well, this was 97 when this happened, um, he bought a brand new Ford truck with a Triton V8, you know, and oil cap said 5W20. 
You know, he goes, I ain't putting that in there. That's, Oof. that. no, he said a lot of choice words because he was a redneck engineer. I know Kevin hates hearing that word. And he proceeded his first oil change to dump Kendall Racing 2050 because, you know. It's I'm not, better. I, well, it's it's more gooder, you know, yeah. and, and I beat my truck. And he came to work and, and he was Spun buying five W20. No, no, it was clacking. Oh. It wasn't ticking. It was clacking. Yeah. And he's like, no, well, I don't know what it's doing. I said, because you didn't put the correct oil in it. Yeah. Yep. You know, now, am I old school? Yes. You're talking to a guy that put 140 weight gear oil in his AX5 to try and get him home one day. Yeah. It, it it made it. Yeah. I mean, it was clacking pretty good. But, no. but again, I understand the idea. Even on, on my Jeep, I'm running 10W40. Yeah. You know, because and, it's higher mileage. And there's nothing wrong with doing it because you know and but knowing what you're doing and knowing what your risks are Mm -hmm. you know sometimes you do need to creep up a little okay and there's a lot of articles on uh, dr google uh that you can find (laughs) about adjustments in your your uh, uh oil weight and if you look carefully you'll actually see it in the back of your owner's manual there's a whole section in there that talks about where and age and temperature mm-hmm. and different grades of oils that can be adjusted and you know what if you stay within those bands you know if you're particularly like you got a warrant and it's starting to to maybe use a little oil now not much is going to fix a seal leak but you know using a little oil etc yeah just don't go any thicker than what it says for running the thing in sahara <laughs> the, the desert seriously they, well, they kind of give you a little leeway a little leeway and and, and you are working with clearances here, and that's what people don't seem to gather is lubricant values are based on the clearance in the engine, and it's the whole engine, wherever that oil is being pumped. So my daughter's uh, Honda mm-hmm. is a turbo. The turbo has tight clearances, okay? I run a 020 in that. The manufacturer says 020. They do not give you leeway off that 020 because, all right, to make that oil work in the turbo was easy. But to make that work in the valve, they had to tighten up the bearing tolerances. So the gap between the um, camshaft and its bearings is much tighter now than you would have found in a comparable earlier engine. Yeah. The connecting rod to crankshaft, the main bearings on the crankshaft are all tightened up. The in play is less so that thin oil doesn't run out. Thin oil works really great as lubricant. It has very low viscosity. There's, It's easy to shear and smooth to turn, but it just won't stay put unless you fence it in and if you think of clearances as fence and oil as cattle you put a low fence and they walk right over it well it's funny you talk about that because on my charger 2012 with the with, again i thought the same engine yeah and it took 5w30 yeah 5w30 motor oil and i'm like okay you know and it, i and i beat it it I, probably was the same castings mm-hmm. but the bearing shells and the clearances and the end plays were more Loose. I and uh, and I had the answer for this yeah. uh, on the on the JK. We had the three point eight. It said to use five W twenty. I put five thirty in it. Yep. And here's the reason why I did that. One, I read a lot of the, knowing what you have. Now the three point eight uh, motor is an older motor. It's a push rod motor. Right. There is no variable valve cam timing on it. Nope. And the reason why I, the the Gladiator now calls with uh, with the um, zero W twenty is that even though the 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 charger had the five W thirty in in a VVT motor. Mm-hmm. I now have a a double variable valve timing in the Gladiator, so it gets a little more punch, a little more power, but that oil has to pass through those cam time phasers. Yep. And and, and, and it's not its just a lubricant job. anymore. It's now a, 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 a hydraulic solid fluid. Yeah. It, yeah, it's the hydraulic fluid for the phasers. Right. Um, and anybody who's owned a tractor mm-hmm. understands the fact that your gear case holds 10 or more gallons, yes, I am saying that correct, folks, gallons of transmission slash hydraulic oil. And it's the same oil that's pumped out to the rams on the bucket and yeah. to lift the mower on the back. It's the same thing your transmission gears are flowing in. And so now you've got an oil that has to have both the characteristics of easy pumpability, high pressure, you know, take extreme high pressures. Oh, but oh, by the way, it's got to keep gears from grinding together that were cast, you know, with the concept of the 1930s. So, yeah, lubrication is one of those that if you 
don't really know what you're playing with, stick with the manufacturer. I'm sorry. And that's why I use the NSG 370 oil in my transmission because I don't want, oh, you can use synchro mesh. Uh, You probably can, but, you know, I beat on things, and so I squirt a little Lucas in it and made it quieter. And and I'll say to that is the manufacturer's recommendations. It doesn't have to be the oil from Mopar, from Jeep, from, you know, whoever. Yeah. Uh, they give you a usually a uh, um, an ASTM certification or, or right. uh, what's the other one? I'm having a, a senior moment here. But the different <laughs> oil API API. Whatever. Thank you, yeah. the American Petroleum Institute. I should have remembered that. But, Man, I'm the one that's uh, here. <laughs> but uh, you know, as long as it's certified and carries the proper stamp, you should be okay. Now, right. I'll be honest with you, Bubba lose oil on the bottom shelf at your local, you know, grocery store that has kind of a, almost nearly looks like the seal from API. <laughs> yeah, well, you might want to. I, I tend to go, well, you know, I tend to doubt, and my Jeep keeps running. Hey, Cletus, this is AP1. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Can we run great value oil? Yeah. So, yeah, you know what? I say that, but Super Tech had its place. It did. It did. I know a lot of people that go, well, the engine's leaking oil faster than I can. <laughs> I can't make it to the next oil change. About 150K on the charger. That's what the charger got. It yeah. got super tech. <laughs> so, but anyway, moving on, that was kind of a fun one there. But the, the corollary to that was looking at the use of the transmission yeah. and knowing that it's going to be under intense you know, load, even in in the lightest sense, you know, Um, wanting to give him as much opportunity. The oil does provide some cushioning between the gears. He obviously had already had an occurrence there where he had overloaded the um, first motion shaft coming in from the engine and had sheared off about four or five teeth uh fortunately the teeth just dropped down in and didn't get intermeshed in the other stuff and cause vicious shredding um so and and a story of a of an old transmission brought back to life and let it go wheel another day exactly now the next one yes folks i told you this was a busy ass couple of weeks was a uh, i'm sorry scott can't i can't leave those words in there Uh, you're killing me smalls you're killing me (laughs) is a good friend of ours dave and dave has a really nice um old willie's wagon Mm -hmm. you know the early version people call him the early gladiator because it has that front face that looks like a gladiator's helmet you know and it's kind of the the wagon you see and mash you know as the ambulance and uh in a lot of different places so it's kind of a really neat old rig but um it had been the previous owner had done a v8 conversion and an automatic transmission, I think. No, no, I think it's a manual. Not that that played into this. But Dave was having some run problems. And uh, so he thought, well, okay, I'm going to replace the, the points. I don't get points. I don't like points. Okay, I, I understood that. Yeah. You know, he, uh, but he put a Pertronics distributor in. And thinking that was... You know, this nice electronic distributor. And Dave, I'm sorry, I'm not picking on you here, but one of the things they did is when he put it in, he took away all of the ancillary points wiring, yeah. including a little white block that goes on the firewall that some of you are going, oh no. And I'm, yeah, I agree with you. He took away the ballast resistor. Now, this is a little bit of old Jeep stuff for you young guys out there, okay? When you look at a firewall on an old Jeep, I don't care if it's got a Chevy conversion or it's a Jeep, it's whatever. If it's got points and a distributor and a coil mounted on the firewall or the side of the engine block, and there's wires going to it, and you look back the wires, and somewhere there's this either uh, white ceramic block with two terminals or four terminals on the end, or some little gray box that sits on the firewall with wires going in and out of it. And don't throw that away. Okay? Yeah. Coils in the old time were literally, and I'm not sure the exact, but let's just call them, they were 9-volt coils. They weren't 12-volt. They were 9-volt. And it may be a little more, a little less, but let's just stick with 9 for the sake of this. And the idea was, in the older cars, let's go 70s, let's go 70 and earlier, all right, Gasoline wasn't what we have today. It wasn't refined. It wasn't to the level of our octanes and ignitability. The sparks were not as hot 
to get this stuff, and our whole carburetor systems weren't as good to get the bloody engine running. Right. Okay. When it's a, a start, so when you turn your ignition key in a normal automobile that has a an ignition key that has a start, run, and accessory position, when you turn it to start, you would feed 12 volts directly to that 9 volt coil. Now, in the long run, that'll overheat it. But for the short term, it basically kicks it in the butt and right. makes really hot spark, which means during the crank to start, you have a boosted spark. Not a bad thing. Get no. your engine started. As soon as you let go of that, though, the, the key switch springs back to the run contacts and puts power on the run wires. And that run wire goes from the key to that ballast resistor which steps the voltage down to 9 volts and feeds the coil in parallel to the other one, but that other circuit on the start is now disconnected. And so the coil happily runs along. Well, when you take that ballast resistor off and feed the coil full-time 12 volts, depends on how well the coil is made, and I think Dave's was made pretty well because he told me it lasted about six months before it went... And died. Puked the oil out of it. You know, it yeah. basically overheated. And yeah, you let out the magic smoke. You let the magic smoke out. So they put another coil in. And it ran for a while, and it started doing the same sort of misfire and this kind of stuff. And fortunately, a friend of the show, John Carl, we've talked about him. We'll talk about him again. John kind of saw that, and he, Dave, uh, let's get you a ballasted resistor. That's just a coil that's got that resistor inside it. Now, you don't get the hot spark during crank. But, you know, you also don't have to worry about it burning out. Right. And we are talking about more modern engines. And it still ran kind of meh. Wonky. Wonky, not great. So he said, well, let me put a fuel injection system on. So he put a fast fuel injector throttle body on it. Right. And they hooked it all up. And it didn't want to spit. You know, it didn't want to pump fuel. It didn't want to behave. Yeah. And so they went ahead and they started playing around and Dave then added, well, I need maybe to put an MSD ignition system on, which is a multi-spark discharge, but the data manufacturer took the initials to MSD. And they started hooking everything up. And no spark, <laughs> no fuel, no nothing. I see where this is going. Um, so here's the, the, the thing, folks. What it was, was it was a little bit of a mystery hunt because the only manual we had was the MSD manual because that's the last part they bought. I didn't have the fast system. I didn't right. have. Uh, but you kind of look at this, and this is a, a little bit of a story for you about take it one step at a time. First thing to do is was the Pertronics behaving itself? Was I getting a digital signal out of the Pertronics? Initially, I was not because the key ignition... Well, they had hooked up the Pertronics only has two wires on it. It's got a red and a black. Right. And they go to the plus and the minus of the coil. Well, it doesn't actually power the coil. Okay. You're supposed to keep your ignition on power, you know, from the key on the positive side. And the Pertronics is actually drawing power <laughs> from the plus side. All right. All right. So if you didn't have your key power to the coil and then pull the Pertronics off. Now, on the flip side, the Pertronics is switching the ground to the coil. And, folks, let me say something. Points are nothing. There's no power to points. Points do not have any. All they do is they sit on that negative terminal of the coil and they close the switch to ground, open the switch. Close the switch to ground, open the switch. So it in itself is not powered. It's just a mechanical system that's opening and closing points, which is a fancy thing for calling a set of switch contacts. Yeah. And if you have a V8, it does it eight times, <laughs> eight, yeah. eight times every two revolutions. Okay, so you get your firing order. Um, and the Pertronics, even though it's an electronic, mimics a points. All it's doing is switching that ground Floating, grounded. Floating, grounded. Floating, grounded. Right. So it had to be powered. So we got it powered. Then, now, to do the, the MSD, here's what got confusing, is you take all that back off the coil. 
and the MSD has two leads that power the coil, and nothing else can go on the coil. So it actually powers and grounds doing so that it can actually, the only way I can think about it is shake the switch. <laughs> Normally you would ground and you get the coil to fire. Now it's going and doing multi-spark discharge right. to make your engine run a little stronger, more fuel efficient. But it has to be triggered. Now it has to be triggered by the points. Well, you don't have points. We now have faux points, you know, electronic points. So right. all we had to do was trigger it via the ground lead to the pertronics. But now I have to feed the key ignition to the MSD and to the pertronics, but not to the coil. Nowhere is that said in a, in a manual, but you have to figure out how these systems work, folks, and that's where we're going with it. And the end result was the, um, and, and if once we did that, and I put the, a, an old-fashioned timing light, inductive timing light, and I put it on the coil wire, not on any one of the things, because I wanted to see if I was getting fire now. And amazing, yeah, we got a really nice light show without getting shocked, you know, blink, 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 blink. Hey, we got coil fire now. Right. Wonderful. Now we got to get fuel. And you go into the, the fast system and it's all got sensors and it's all, it's, it turns out that it's a pretty neat little system that, okay, you put your battery here. Okay. And we can feed that from over here where we actually fuse it to ground and we have a ground connection here. So, and then we got to give it, let it know that ignition is on. Oh, gee, there's another wire for the key switch to let the fast system know we're going. And then how do I trigger the fast? How do I time the fast so that the, it injects the fuel with the intakes of, you know. Right. And it turns out it's supposed to pick up off a tack lead. Well, the MSD does have a tack lead. The funny thing was is none of these colors lined up. <laughs> so we made a spaghetti nest on the fender and the hood, or, or not the hood, but the, the hood uh, brace things, you know, up in air with little jumpers and clips and tied it all together. And I mean, I, I admit, I love the fact that everybody's looking at me with a raised eyebrow going, no way this is going to just, I said, well, it may, you know, we, let's just, I don't know, because, you know, this is the first time it's going to start like that. We turned the key. It didn't do one full revolution, that thing lit off. Everybody was just like, I won't use the words they used because you would yeah. bleep it again. But there was some level of astonishment that I had mm -hmm. mixed up all of these parts. One of the issues that they had run against is the MSD has several inputs for timing. And one of them is a magnetic inductance loop. Well, that's what the Pertronics uses. So they'd hooked it up to the magnetic inductance. However... While the Pertronics uses magnetic induction internally, that's the little coil with the little spiky star wheel that doesn't actually touch that just spins inside that magnetic field. Mm -hmm. And every time the spiky tooth goes past there, it goes, oh, there's a point, there's a point, there's a point. Um, there it is, there it is. There exactly. It is. And But then it uses electronics to go switch it to ground, switch to ground, switch to ground, switch. You don't actually read the magnetic inductance. You read... A, and, and what it boils down to is magnetic inductions puts out a sine wave, pretty much. Not a pure sine wave, but a zero rises up in a curve in an arc as the, the point, the little thing, metal moves in line, gives you a peak, and then as it goes away, it comes down smoothly. All right? That's not a set of points. Points are square waves, digital. You know, yeah, there's technically, if you get into the milli, milli, milliseconds, there's a ramp. But that ramp's really steep. The points are closed, you're grounded. Right. As quick as electricity can flow, you know. And then when they open, they're, you know, you, you build full potential. There's very little ramp. So it's really is as close to a perfect square wave as you can get. And the MSD cannot take a sine wave on its square wave input. It would fire occasionally, which would make, you know, the fast unit go maybe once every 20, you know, 30. So it would cough or it might sputter. It might make a noise. Um, it might send a spark out. It might not. Right. Uh, it was the key is if you're going to mix systems, make sure you understand what each system needs mm -hmm. and what it puts out. How is it fired? I had to, to do a quick test, and it's not a graceful one. Is I'm looking at the fast system. We fired it up, and I go, okay, this is supposedly the, the tack trigger lead. Let me. I wonder if it tr triggers to power or ground. Well, it's safer to trigger to ground. Let me just 
tap it on the the side of the intake manifold and as i go tap 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 you hear oh it switches to ground um so a little bit of the deductive side there but uh miss daisy the name of that jeep uh it took us about two hours to figure out all the pieces get them all lined up and four and a half hours to actually hardwire it so it was permanent yeah. uh, to make it neat to make it safe uh, it involved some the battery was in the back so we had to bring new heavy gauge power wires from the battery all the way up to power both the MSD and the uh, the fast system the fast wasn't the big draw but I will tell you that MSD sucks down some power you mm-hmm. know you think about the fact that I'm not sparking once per compression stroke but maybe five six seven eight nine ten times so yeah you need some juice behind you need it. some juice behind that so we did get dave back up and running again uh mm-hmm. it was for me it was a lot of fun um figuring out these different systems you know some i've worked with i worked with the uh the msd system in the past i'd never worked with a fast fast uh fuel injection but it seems like a really neat system it worked really well and it's a really simple trigger that you know and the tack feed could have just been as simple as hooking it up to the negative terminal of the coil on the pertronics but again he's already got all that kind of stuff on there. <laughs> so that was miss daisy and then uh the latest one was the one we left you guys with a teaser on the last show yeah and that was our friend john carl again and john and i got together again uh i did work out uh with him and actually i've got to give a shout out um to specialty drive shafts in um uh brandon Brandon florida Florida, yeah Yeah, no i just you would stop to look at the electronics and no no just just check um shane and the crew at specialty drive shaft you know they can work on antique Jeep drive shafts. Mm-hmm. And I will tell you right here and now, I, I wish I had. Um, you know, we'll have to post his contact info. Yeah, that's easy. I can uh, do that. Okay, he'll, he'll do that. If you have a CJ3A, a CJ2, you know, one of the rare ones, a CJ4, fives, you know, the pencil shafts that everybody says, oh, you can't get those, you can't fix those, you can't. Guess what? Shane fixed both original drive shafts for the cj 3a for john um including the slip joints which get kind of wobbled out he was able to put new ends on them uh and get them the right length balance them and even though folks when they call these pencil shafts they're they, that one shaft's like only about an inch and a quarter in diameter to the front drive shaft the entire length not just the you know, slip area and he did a gorgeous job on it and the rear as well got them as tight as probably tighter than when they came off the factory floor so again if you're getting the run around i don't care where you are he does accept by you know you can ship your shafts to him you can call them um but they they can handle just about any of them so a real big shout out there because he helped get uh, uh, this CJ3A back on the road again. Uh, so back to the teaser. What I left you with last time was the alternator wasn't charging. Okay. Still. Still. Uh, probably my third attempt. And um, what we discovered is the, and I think I talked a little bit about it last time, was they're pretty simple. This is a GM alternator mounted to the little Go Devil 60 horsepower flathead. Um, normally, is a pretty easy hookup. Three wires. One of them is the big fat one that goes to the battery. And the other two are called the pin one and pin two. Pin one is called the excitation. Um, no you know nasty thoughts there folks it's just yeah. the electrical kick in the fanny to get the alternator started generating mm-hmm. and the other one is the sense wire in other words i'm going to go out and look at the voltage in the system and see do i need to start charging more all right, right. now a lot of people including um uh, John had just taken that sense wire right up to the stud. That's all it did. Just loop back to the battery stud on the back of the alternator. And that's okay if you have a very simple system and you don't have big current drops okay, around the network. Um, because it's this, it, hopefully it's the same voltage as the battery. But you do put yourself in a little bit of trouble with that, or you can, is that if you don't have a very balanced system where, where the voltage is consistent across the system, um, 
you won't know that you need more voltage because you're pulling right. it right on the back of the alternator. It's going, yeah, I'm putting out 13.9. I don't need to put out any more. It's fine. And meanwhile, your stereo is starving because it's down 25 feet of too small a wire. Right. Um, and so, but that's one of those easy ones to fix. You just move where that thing senses. And here's the key. You got to use a heavy gauge on that sense wire. Not because you're pulling a lot of current, but you right. don't want resistance. You want it to read pretty accurately. Uh, but in uh, John's case, the back of the alternator was fine. I mean, he... <laughs> He's got like four fuses in the whole Jeep, guys. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and and that, his that big includes stereo, the one for the radio. Yeah. yeah, well, the big stereo has its own, and it draws directly off the battery. And the battery's close enough. I mean, literally, I think uh, ten inches away. <laughs> yeah, if that. So, so it reads pretty well. No, folks, what we came to the realization was that every wiring diagram out there on that three wire tells you to take the excitation line, come off the key. From, in his case, the run position, he doesn't have a start position. He's got a foot starter, you know, where he presses the block down, you know, yeah. a little pedal. Um, take it through an indicator light, a 12-volt indicator light, and run it to terminal 1 on the alternator. And what happens there is that light is your I'm not charging light. And what happens is when you start the Jeep or you turn the key on, current will flow from the key through the light to the field. Right. Internal to the alternator, once it starts generating its own power, it will feed backwards against terminal one and keep its own field alive. Right. Okay. Yeah, it jump starts the system. It jump starts, and so what happens is the other side of that wire now is 12 volts from the generate from the alternator. Well, if you have 12 on both sides, we talked about this on the TJ side marker lights. If you have 12 volts on both sides, it's the same as having no volts on both sides, and the light goes out. Right. And if your alternator quits charging, then all of the excitation power comes from the uh, <laughs> key again, and the light comes on, and you know your alternator's not working. Right. Well, you want an interesting challenge, folks? Try and find a 12-volt incandescent panel light. Now, I'm not saying you can't. Yeah, yeah there's I found, tons of them in the Smithsonian. Yeah, that's about it. We found, I think, four. Okay? Yeah. From places like Granger, you know, um, I can't remember the other one, but some of the other industrial supply houses, even they don't carry a lot, but they realize there's some panel-mounted equipment in, and I called Granger to ask, he goes, oh, you want an alternator charge light? All right. And John had used a completely different light, which 99% of you probably would have too. And there's a huge number of them out there, and it's a LED. LED. Yeah. Well, folks, an LED internal. Well, first off, LEDs, if you've got any bit of electronic bent and you've ever played with this stuff, you're going to know that most LEDs function in around the 2-volt range. They have a pretty significant resistor inside that little housing to drop 12 volts down to 2 volts. Uh, so you don't burn out your resistor. Some of them are even lower than 2 volts. You know, Some of them, excitation is only about 1.7. And that's to get into the LED. And then some of that gets chewed up and spit out as light. Right. So what comes out is usually less than 1 volt, which, gee, isn't enough to kickstart no. the alternator. Now, what I think is really fun about this is you could wire it directly and not have a light, but then you'd never know if you're charging or not charging. Yes, tell me I can put a ammeter on it. He has one, but he doesn't really want it wired in there because ammeters draw 100% of your current current from the battery that goes to the rest of the Jeep. Right. And, uh, yeah, they, they, there's a lot of voltage in there that can let out a lot of magic smoke and start fires. Uh, voltmeters, well, they, they can be somewhat instructional. Uh, you start looking, oh, wait a minute, I'm at 11 volts. Well, you've had to be offline for a while to know. Yeah. Uh, the, the alternator light's a great thing. It's just, where do I find an incandescent bulb? Because incandescent bulbs are neat. From an electronic point of view, they're what they're called a thermally variable resistor. Right. When they're cold, they pass a lot of current. As they heat up, they get tighter and tighter and tighter, and they get brighter and brighter and brighter, and that's how they work. More and more resistance. More and more resistance, but that works really well where you want a bright light, you know, when you first start to say, okay, we're starting, and then when the voltages match, it goes out. So it's not that big a deal. Well, we found one place there was an incandescent bulb, and that's, he had an old um, license plate light. You can still buy those, and they have the little peanut bulb in. You you quoted the oh, yeah the one ninety four one twenty or one sixty eight or uh, right. one ninety two, and they take the 
incandescent peanut bulb. Yes. <laughs> which you can still get. Yes. Um, and I said, let's do an experiment. Right there on the fender. We, I said, you had another LED? He said, yeah. I said, I want to do this on the fender and see if it works. And so we put the LED, which he was going to have in the dash, and the incandescent bulb, which we'll talk about in a minute, and we put them together. They're pluses together and they're minuses together. And then I put a lead to the battery, you know, with just a jumper clip, like a like a key, you know. And You're the other a test rig. The other one down to terminal one, and without the engine running, I locked it on, and both lights came on. Oh, that's pretty cool. I didn't know if it'd leave enough current from the one to the other. That they both came on. And we started the Jeep. Started fine. And both lights went out as soon as the alternator. And I'm looking with a VOM at the thing. And it came up to... It wouldn't quite get to 14 volts unless you really rev the engine. But that's the pulley size on the alternator, which yeah. can be adjusted. But it would hold 13.6, 13.8 uh, without a problem. And that will charge your battery. Uh, and that's part of that sense thing I was talking about, too. Uh, so it's like, hmm... And he's like, I can deal with it. I'm going to put that bulb and I'm going to shove it up under the dash. Right. Just, I'll tie it to something zip tie. He says, but it, I got to be able to drive my Jeep. It ends up that when he did zip tie it up under the dash, when you turn the key on, his doesn't have a start key. It's just an on and an off. And when you turn it on, you crank with a foot push and it is an yeah. M, an M, a, a CJ3A which was sold overseas as well as local so the foot pedal that has a rod that goes to a little bell crank on the end of the starter and the starter has a push button on it that you have to push in to activate the solenoid and crank um, is in the middle of the jeep so is this pedal and the light shone down like it was a foot light to show you where to stomp on the starter pedal <laughs> And it was, he's like, yeah, I think we're going to leave this this way. <laughs> hey, it's funny how, like, life has those little happy little accidents, uh, you know? Well, yeah, and so now we have a really effective way to both l see where the starter pedal is as well as uh, kickstart the alternator. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the other thing we did learn, interestingly enough, is that old one-barrel carburetor doesn't have a fast idle cam on it. Yeah. Uh, so you start it up, and it goes immediately to boom, 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 which is not a fast enough speed for the alternator to self-excite. <laughs> now, once you get it self-excited, it's okay. So what you have to do is it's sitting there going boom, 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 rev it once, and the light goes out, and it doesn't come back on because... <clears throat> you've established your field you're, you're actually at your armature current right and now it's generating enough to keep itself alive <laughs> but you got to give it that one little you know swift uh let's kick just say tush. kick kick in the tush to get it fired off so there's a little trick for any of you doing the you know older vehicles and converting over to a uh an alternator and using the gm three wire format which is probably the most common one out there is using the light that is shown on all the hundreds of wiring diagrams you can find on Dr. Google. Uh, it can't be an LED. Now, your other option that would work is we did put about a 50 ohm resistor in parallel with that LED and that worked fine. That put enough current into the LED but also let more than enough go through to kickstart the alternator. The downside is if you leave the key on without actually cranking for an excessive amount of time you'll burn things out it gets really hot in fact yeah. john burned his hand you know fingers i thought it wasn't getting that hot it isn't when it's running you know the alternator's running it's zero currents flowing through there because you right. got 12 volts from both ends but and uh, now we were doing the test with a quarter watt and it didn't burn up immediately and i expect if you got one of those led resistors you get with the led conversion for taillights so that your blinker still works you know what i'm talking about mm -hmm. those things are like i i think they're 50 watt you know not f quarter watt you know they're huge but you're still going to generate that heat and draw your battery down if you turn the key on and just leave it on right so his light bulb one's a little better it you leave the key on it's not going to burn anything up it's like leaving your dome light on it will take the battery down but it's a little safer and why not get something out of that power 
Yeah. Well, like being able to see where the pedal is. Yeah, now you got under the dash rock lights. Yeah. So <laughs> Booyah shaka. So anyway, folks, I know we've probably run a little bit long with this story, but... Yeah, I, m- I might cut this into a part one, part two, because it's an hour and a half. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So sorry about that. But, you know, I keep getting emails from folks about, tell me more tech, tell me more tech. <laughs> well... Apparently, the rest of the people around here heard you and started saying, you need tech. So here, you come fix this company here. No, in all honesty, I love helping folks with it. We got a new project coming up for Scott since we're already running a little bit long here. Yeah, we were working on the, uh, the, we we got the AMP Research Steps, Mm -hmm. PowerStep XL. Thanks, Mark, at the Jeep Lab for that. And, um, but the, uh, we're going to, we're working on a way to make them usable with the doors off with the doors off or with tube doors or with any mm-hmm. options like that because right now they're tied into the the, the factory uh, well not factory i guess yeah. amps wiring system has you trigger them off your door uh lights right you know the, the and that's great if you have doors on you yeah. take the doors off the, the light, steps don't come down now yeah either the stores either they come down and stay or they don't come down at all they don't come down at all okay well because you disable the lights when you yep. unplug the harness mm-hmm. um and uh, that's not acceptable to your side of the financial nope. department. She wants to be able to use the doors like you can on your uh, yep. rock slides. So we're going to kind of, and the problem is these are not as simple wiring harness as the uh, steps that I have. Mine are quite a few years older. Yeah. You use a little bit simpler technology. Um, these steps he's got are... They're smart steps. Yeah. They, they look at the whole Jeep system, and there's the main module, and then there's the sub-module sub that looks at the, the light circuits and all mm-hmm. that stuff. And so we're going to carefully kind of go through the wiring on this, and we've already done some preliminary stuff to say, okay, is this reading 12 volts being switched to ground, like the old style, or is it right. reading digital off of nothing to you know we don't know what it's reading so we're actually going to install them per the factory and then i'm going to pop some test equipment on those leads and go what you looking at Mm -hmm. (laughs) and then we're going to recreate that same signal with some magnetic uh reed switches Mm -hmm. um and probably some either uh, you know rockers or uh, push on, push off, locking switches, so yeah. that w- once the magnetics, you know, there's no doors. It's the same thing as the door being open. So we got to be able to make sure the steps go closed. Mm-hmm. Um, or as you say, you know, when you unplug the doors, then it goes okay. There's no dome light, and you could go in theoretically and hit your dome light switch to bring all the steps down at one time and go back up again. Uh, <laughs> Scott just got this. We, oh my! You, you, you know what? <laughs> All joking aside, that may be the answer. Yeah, but that's inelegant in my book. Uh, but we will see. But that, it'll work. And here's the whole thing we're going to play with. That signal may not be coming to the door when you hit the switch yeah. that way. Uh, so we're going to be looking at how does the amp um, step f- trigger? Mm-hmm. What is the trigger? How do we recreate that trigger? without using the Jeep's wiring Mm -hmm. so that it can be an independent. So that's going to be a fun little project to work it out. And, of course, there's this whole thing about, well, I can't damage the XL circuit control system. So I've got to do it very gently Mm -hmm. and do it non-invasive inspections on what it's triggering on and how. I don't want to go, okay, I got it all figured out. Oh, by the way, you need a new door closing module for the Jeep and a new control module for the... (laughs) Power yeah. Step XL. Uh, so there's going to be more tech to come here, folks. Mm-hmm. And you know what? One of these days, we'll actually get out and drive these Jeeps. Now that I can put gas in mine. Yes. Yay. That was important. <laughs> Well, folks, this has been a long show, probably the end of part two. Yes. Um, We'll have to decide. You'll have to let me know where you split it so I can make the video match. Yeah, Uh, I'll I'll, I'll probably do it at the, uh, the, the, when we go to break. Okay. Yeah. Oh, you can confirm that in the next day or so. So, folks, we hope you found this, uh, interesting Mm -hmm. um it's a little bit of a different uh you know me running around kind of helping uh fellow jeepers that's kind of the fun thing to do and uh, we do have to remember that uh coming up here really soon is crawling for the phone crawling for the phone and jeeping with judd uh, registration is open is open Uh, limited very limited limited. uh they will have uh 
some, and I got to put that in quotes because it's not defined yet, but there will be some uh, cash at the gate kind of things. Mm-hmm. It is a little more this year because he still needs to raise the funds, but there's only like I think 1,600 or 1,500 pre registrations, and uh, then there'll be some uh, uh, some at the gate, but they're trying to keep the crowd down uh, from the COVID, obviously, and, and it's a yeah. sad fact of life right now. Yep. Uh, so if you got the time, you know, get online right now to. Uh, uh, Jeep and with Judd, believe me, you start to type that in. I, Google will definitely find it. Able to finish it uh, and uh, get on that pre-registration site and get your sites right now. I saw within the first day almost every one of the optional buy-ups for your the the specialty VIP parking, the access, and all that stuff. The mostly gone. The fast pass. This is their new thing they introduced this year for all the rides, so that you didn't have to sit at the back of the queue to get on one of the trails. You could go up with a fast pass and go to the front they're gone everything but you know you can still get to the event and it's still for an absolutely wonderful cause Mm -hmm. uh uh sheriff grady judd and and his crew the whole you know that's uh, they they do such a wonderful job there at clear springs ranch ranch in Mm -hmm. bartow florida so uh um hopefully you guys will get out there and and like i said also too because crown for the Vaughn is coming up in november so check out off-road united for there they have all the details and all their pages yeah one other email that came through too that i wanted to make sure i touched base on uh a listener is listening to us on the uh itunes podcast app and for some reason it only starts on show 47 okay it it only for some reason only does like or 27 do we can only do 100 shows Hmm. and unfortunately it's nothing we do it's apple itunes but if you go to the spotify if you go we're on we're on um, amazon just go to our website if you you want to right you can get every broadcast there exactly every but like i said uh, amazon spotify all the other players have all the episodes yeah and again if you can't find uh, on the trail podcast.com go to the archives you can hear from episode one when we were just starting out and where we were trying to, to not sound. screw up yes. our... <laughs> exactly. So everything's a lot more free for him now. So again, so to that listener, you can check out those uh, the, the older shows that way. And again, if you have any questions, just give us an email on the trail podcast at gmail.com. But Kevin, I think we have done enough talking. I really do. And now that I, I'm not even going to lock hubs, I just need to get the Jeep to the gas station. Yeah, you're going to put gas so, in it. So, you know, we're, we're going to get that thing down to the down to the petrol station you know and, and pip pip and fill her up so that uh, she's ready to go and thank you for joining us on land rover cast and uh, <laughs> no, wait, wait, so, wait, sinister has got that sinister already has that so. yeah so anyway folks we, we've had a lot of fun you've yep. let me go off on a technical dive deeper than i think i've gone in a year or two hey it's okay um and that's what they uh, want oh i've had a blast doing it you know mm-hmm. i i'm happy as can be to help folks out when i can um mm-hmm. there's only so much of me but still it's a lot of fun to go out there and and some of these challenges have been kind of interesting i've never had to build an ax-15 out of the wreckage of two <laughs> um and then actually dry shifted all the way through all five gears that was a novel concept mm-hmm. um and then the uh, same sort of thing going okay you want to use a pertronics with an msd and, an, and a fast in uh, 350 Chevy crate motor shoved into a 50 something uh, Jeep Wagoneer or whatever. Or, I think it's 63, Miss 63. Daisy. 63. Yeah. Uh, and um, sure, why not? Let's see what we can do. <laughs> Yay! Yeah. And uh, and then of course my favorite at the moment. I, I got I gotta just say working with John Carl is just so much fun in that Jeep, mm-hmm. uh, folks. He is. <laughs> His license got the latest Ooh. picture. Yeah, I was going to say, ahead. he finally got his newest uh, uh, upgrade. He, yeah. got an, okay, he got a Mach 50 Cal, yeah. <laughs> a.k.a. Rat Patrol. And yep. if you don't know what that is, Google it. Mm-hmm. It was a pretty awesome TV show. Yeah. Um, and you'll see a bunch of these willies yeah, in the Sahara there. Desert, Hassel supposedly. Haslan Rommel. Has, yeah, Haslan Rommel. And, uh, but please don't try to ride it jumping a dune, standing in the back, hanging on to a 50 Cal. Cal. Um, but I told... Uh, That's how you break your nose and end up like Nico McBrain from Iron Man. <laughs> but I told John, I said, okay, you've just given a whole new definition to open carry. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, we got to run, folks. Again, uh, as we always say, you know, um, we are legal. Tread lightly. Take nothing but pictures. Pictures. <laughs> <laughs>
Take nothing but pictures, memories, and your trash Please. when you leave the trail. We want to have them there for our grandkids as well. Absolutely. And I almost got it. I almost got it out. I almost did it. <laughs> we'll and try then, sleep next time. Yeah, oh, man, and my lips failed me. <laughs> so on that note, we will talk to you guys later. I hope you have a good one. And uh, look forward to Halloween. Trick or treat safe if you're trick or treating. If not, just buy a bag of M&M's and pour them in a bowl. I'm going as a parts guy. All right. On that note, <laughs> bye. Bye now. Oh, I eat apple.